didn't expect I was going to be speaking quite this early on the uh, schedule. I'm listed for about uh, 45 minutes or an hour from now because uh, uh, Professor uh, Parfit is, uh, is ill. Uh, I was asked to uh, say a few words. Uh, and actually, this is something that's uh, very interesting to me. In 1992, there was an article that came out in the New York Times about a fellow in New Mexico who seemingly had found that he had Jewish ancestry. So when I got my wife and, uh, and children to bed that night, I called everyone in Albuquerque with that last name uh, because I just wanted to reach out to the individual. Not that I knew what I would say if I was able to find him, and I was. Um, and I was a little tongue-tied, which, which people that know me know that's somewhat rare. Um, but I said to him, welcome home. And uh, that began a, uh, a relationship. Ultimately, I went out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and, uh, and went to his bar mitzvah, um, which took place when he was 28. And, um, and then I invited him to Houston, Texas, where he spoke in, um, in 1992 for the, uh, the 500th uh, anniversary of the expulsion from Spain. So since that time, in the late 1990s, early uh, 2000s, I started a DNA testing company uh, specifically for genealogical purposes. I didn't realize there would be anthropological purposes at that time because my background is not as a scientist, but it's something that I've come to uh, to know a little bit and, and appreciate and respect a lot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share some stories uh, from people who I will tell you, in my opinion, have a somewhat tortured background. That's because in one way or another, in one country or another, they were ripped away from Judaism uh, and uh, certainly by the thousands, and I will tell you as someone who who deals with this practically every day, they are returning by the ones. Uh, the first story is about a, a woman named Berta. Uh, she was living in France at the time, but knew she came from, I mean, came from Spain, came from a Catholic family that amazingly, after 500 years, still had an oral tradition that they had been Judeos, that they had been Jews. Uh, she was unable to document this, with traditional uh, genealogy, and she heard about DNA testing and said, I'm going to do a DNA test to see if I might be able to find something. Uh, now, we've heard lectures earlier today that, uh, that talked about this, uh, this confusion between, you know, between someone's you know, historical feelings and, and you know, their identity. Uh, well, interestingly, in this particular case, when we were when we received the results, she matched no one in, in our company's database, which had primarily Ashkenazi Jews and non-Jewish uh, people of European descent. Uh, then I, uh, I talked to Dr. Bahar about this. He said, I happen to have an unpublished database at this point, and I can share that with you. Uh, he did. Uh, I looked, and I looked first at the, at the people in his database who came from countries that touched the Mediterranean Sea, that were non-Jews, and there were no matches whatsoever. Then um, uh, I looked at, to see the matches, or if there were any matches among people who were of Jewish origin, and this is what we found. We found that uh, in Dr. Bahar's database, there were two people from Algeria living in Israel who claimed to be Sephardic, one from Bulgaria who claimed to be Sephardic, and five from Turkey, also living in Israel, who claimed to be Sephardic. So, needless to say, she was uh, she was excited about this. Uh, you know, when I when I told her that these were the results that we found, and I felt comfortable telling her that it appeared to me that she was of Jewish origin. And when I talk to people, I try to be very very clear that being of Jewish origin is just exactly that. It's some time in the past. You came from a gene pool which is monopolized or dominated by you know, Jews or not. In her case, yes. Since that time, we have found some other people. Uh, someone from uh, originally from Cuba, now living in uh, Miami. Someone from Greece. A couple people from Italy. 
one in Morocco, and you can see four in Spain. Those are the people that I refer to as the ones who never left. And I'll show you more on that uh, in a couple of minutes. Let's see. I guess. Okay. Um, I also had a re I had a uh, email from someone from the island of Mallorca. He says since the time of the Inquisition, it was dangerous to be a Jew in Mallorca, and no one would talk about the subject. The conversions were so enforced that for many years the Chuetas uh, had to show that they were very religious of the Christian faith, and even though uh, they were not accepted in that society even until this day, and he says all that he's learned about Judaism, he's learned on his own. Again, from, from that, that personal feeling, he says, I see all this heritage as a responsibility to do something to go back to my roots. I'm not married yet, and really it would be great if I had a Jewish wife. Uh, in that way, Judaism would be important to get in my family, and my kids would be Jewish, all back to the way it was. Uh, later, uh, I got another email from him after I had asked him, had he done his genealogy? He says, yes. I have my family tree back to the 1500s, and all uh, ancestors on my mother's side have a combination of the 15 Chueta names. As you know, there was a lot of endogamy as they did not marry with other peoples with non-Jewish heritage. My grandmother, Chueta, uh, from both mother and father's sides, was the first to marry a non-Chuetan since the forced conversions of the 1500s. If you see the matches in her DNA, it looks like a shul directory. <laughs> Um, and so, this is actually, I think this, uh, so, uh, this, the mtDNA, for those of you that know the phylogeny on the mtDNA side, know that this is ROA2M, which is a Middle Eastern, uh, a Middle Eastern sequence. In other words, it's not one of those European sequences that were talked about earlier. And when you make a comparison to him and the people that he matched, which was on that previous slide here, if you look at the people that he matches, they're actually all Ashkenazi Jews, which would tell me that in all likelihood, this DNA was in the ancient Judean gene pool and some people migrated one direction and some people migrated in a different direction. This is kind of an interesting one. Uh, this fellow uh, named Guillermo Carrasco uh, came to us a number of years ago and he said, I have all these matches on my page and it says Ashkenazi. And I said, well, I'd be happy to look that up for you. After he and I talked, I found that he had left Spain, his family had left Spain Chile about a hundred years ago and uh, and then in the last couple generations the family had moved to the United States he was calling up he was curious he didn't really know what this word Ashkenazi meant I began to look at his results and when I got down to the uh, to the uh, Sephardic from Bulgaria something a light went off uh, in my mind and so I went to see the names of his matches uh, first here's a picture of where the people that he matches on his male inherited Y chromosome, which is J1, which is one of the common uh, Jewish, one of the common haplogroups found among Jews. Uh, he had matches in Mexico, in New Mexico, and, uh, and in the United States. And then most of his matches were over here in Eastern Europe. Of course, he has a couple matches uh, here in Spain. So I looked at the list of the names, and he has this fella named Echevarria, uh, Dominguez, Echevarria, Rabino, uh, Rabinowitz, Romero, uh, down here is uh, Tenorio, Apple, Stanley, and you come down just a little bit further, and I found my name. <laughs> and so this was a shock, to say the least. Um, not only have I, have I demanded the right to eat uh, rice on Pesach from my Ashkenazi wife, but, uh, but it's, it's told me a little bit something about myself that I would never have been able to determine by looking in a mirror. Uh, his matches uh, are either to Hispanic Catholics living in New Mexico or to Eastern European Jews. 
Um, and what can a reasonable con person <coughs> conclude from that, in my opinion, that he came from a Jewish genetic gene pool, like I did and like all of the other Jews, except some of us left Spain and some of us stayed in Spain. His family stayed in Spain. Uh, when I talked to him on the phone, he said that he came to Israel uh, a couple of years before he did this test. And he had planned, as he said, to go around the country. He went to Jerusalem first, went to the wall, didn't know what he was doing there, uh, but came and put his hand against the wall, and he said he began to cry. And this, again, to me, represents this, this what may be an illusion, what may not be an illusion of a genetic uh, memory. He, from Jerusalem, called his uncle and said, where were we from in Spain? Uh, uh, his uncle said, I, I don't know uh, exactly, but uh, as he pressed him on the subject, his uncle said, I knew we came from a region where they killed a lot of Jews. He said, I didn't ask him about Jews, but this was what my uncle volunteered to me. And uh, uh, when I typically speak to Hispanics, I apologize to them for the way that, that, that if they came to a synagogue, the way they're treated by Ashkenazim, because we Ashkenazim tend to look at them as in, why are you in my synagogue, and what are you doing here, and did you come for a handout or a donation? Uh, and and I, I try to explain to, to these, uh, these folks who may be interested in returning and may just be interested in their personal history, but we Ashkenazim have also had a somewhat tortured past in Europe, and sometimes it's difficult for us to understand why someone would want to join our club. Now, the Jews on a genetic level. Earlier we, uh, we heard uh, three or four more minutes? Yeah, okay. So, um, we heard about uh, Kostler and his book, The uh, 13th Tribe. Uh, because of that, I have gone into our database and I have uh, kind of laboriously pulled out Ashkenazi samples, worked hard to weed out all the men with the same name so I would be looking at just a single, what appeared to be a single lineage based on surname. And I came up with a, a pie chart of Ashkenazim and Sephardim. And I kind of enjoy showing that because if Kostler was right, it should jump right off the screen. So here is the, uh, is the phylogenetic tree. These arrows show the branches of the tree of mankind where we find Jews, whether it's Ashkenazi, Sephardic, or Mizrahi. Doesn't matter. This is what the Sephardic pie chart looks like, where about 48% are from a branch called uh, J, about uh, North Africa, about 13%, the Caucasus, uh, about 16%, uh, and a few bit players over here, the Q that was mentioned earlier, for example. And now we look at the Ashkenazi, and it's just not very different. Essentially, we have uh, in the low 40s for uh, J, we do have an elevated R1B, certainly it could be genetic drift, uh, G or founder effect, G is a little bit less. The R uh, component is the same. The T component um, is the same. The Q component is elevated. Um, why, we don't know, but it's not dramatic and doesn't, it's not enough to confirm in anyone's mind unless someone that has an agenda uh, to believe that, that Q, which is European, and uh, I'm sorry, Asian, Central Asian, uh, would be would be from the Khazars. I think that that's kind of silly. But just to have a little fun, I took some data that I received from Dr. Michael Hammer, uh, who had a listing of uh, <coughs> the same kind of information for Muslims from the Middle East, and I thought that that would be illustrative as well. As you can see here, their percentage of J, their percentage of North African from the Caucasus, the R1B and the, and the T are practically the same. In other words, it's very, very clear that, that Ashkenazim, just like Sephardim, are on the male line, are a people from the Middle East. And just to have a little fun, I thought I would show you what, uh, what the land of the Khazars looks like. After this, let's see, this is 
all of them together. And this is what the this is what the Ukrainians look like. Clearly different. Uh, the percentages are way off. Eight percent on this uh, J group, which is typical of the Middle East. Uh, low G, low on the uh, North African. Very very high on I. This is found in a couple percent in Ashkenazi Jews. But unfortunately. DNA cannot answer everyone's question. This is a letter, I will read it to you, that I received from a woman in Portugal, I'm sorry, in Puerto Rico. Again, memory and feeling. My grandmother is the last of the line to carry the surname. They apparently were not religious, but made the claim of their heritage. I don't know why else they would want to when the whole world seems to demonize us at every junction in history. My mother continues to carry on the spoken tradition that we are Jewish, and I grew up with a menorah and a mezuzah all my life, but we did not religiously mingle as Jews. I now have five children and cannot rest, nor do I have peace until I know if this claim is true. I understand that they may have converted secretly, and the bloodline may not reveal that religious conversion, but they claim we are descendants of Jews. It truly disquiets my spirit, not knowing or even being able to locate the origin of the surname. If I am a Jew, beyond the shadow of a doubt, then I want to, I want to be counted as one, not just from the oral tradition. If I am a Jew, then I want to live as one. I want to stand in the face of the world and say, here I stand before you, the one you tried to wipe off the face of the earth, and look, I now have five children to carry this bloodline for generations until the end of time and until the end of days. And Thank I still get a response when I read that. Thank you. Okay. And this is a final email from her um, where I ask her, just give me one second, where she says, I really uh, would like to get someone to test, but I can't find any people who are appropriate candidates. Uh, I would like to see where I fall since my grandmother is not willing um, and finds this whole thing suspect. Either way, we had Hanukkah blood or no blood, I live as a Jew. And all it takes is a swab to get, become part of this, so to speak, conspiracy. Uh, quick slide where the woman says, you don't look anything like the long-haired skinny kid I married 25 years ago. I need a DNA test to make sure it's still you. And the last slide, look, I'm in the DNA business. I mean, I'm not encouraging what this next guy is doing in the next slide, but it shows you how DNA has become part of the society we live in. It's the picture of a man with a placard leaning over saying, need money for DNA test. Girlfriend might be sister. <laughs> And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.